Good morning, welcome to Full Scottish. We've been out for a, for a while, but we're back now with an hour-long programme of Scottish news and culture. Every Sunday at midday, you can watch the show on uh, uh, broadcastscotland.scot. Uh, you can watch it live or you can watch it any time in the future. So we hope you join us every Sunday, midday, for Full Scottish. Good morning and welcome back to Full Scottish, an hour-long programme of Scottish news and culture, looking at the big stories of the day. Looking at the papers this morning, um, it's, it's obvious there are a number of big stories dominating the headlines. Um, Sunday Herald, for me, has the most interesting of exclusives. Um, it's a story about the naming of, of, of Steak Knife. Sunday Herald was the first newspaper to name Steak Knife way back in 2003. Today they're looking at uh, the, the reverberations from the arrest of the, the IRA double agent. His name is Frederick Scap Scappuccini. He was arrested um, on Tuesday. There are allegations that he was involved in various murders while he was working as a double agent in the higher echelons of uh, the IRA. Neil Mackay was the investigations editor that broke that story in 2003 and he's now editor of the Sunday Herald, so they have a four-page news report on it, which is um, looking at the, at the various... Um, events which will happen as a result of his arrest. The families of the victims of the murder are looking to turn the investigation into Brigadier Gordon Kerr, who was the British officer in charge of Scappuccini's um, operations. So we'll see. I think that story has a long way to run. It's an excellent four-page investigation in the Sunday Herald. Um, other uh, news that we're looking at in this programme includes the re resignation of Angus Robertson as SNP uh, deputy leader and various uh, strands of the never-ending Brexit story. I'm joined today to discuss these and other issues by James Dornan, who's the SNP MSP for Glasgow Cathcart, and Philippa Whitford, who is the SNP MP for Central Asia. And we'll also have some music and some discussion with uh, Iona Fife and Aberdeenshire folk singer. So, without further ado, let's get started. I think we shall start with the... Angus Robertson resignation, which came about yesterday uh, without much advance notice. Um, clearly, there's a lot to discuss about who his successor will be. Early days yet to decide to discuss that, really. But we need to look and see. Um, what, but first of all, James, what do you think Angus has, has done for the party in his time as deputy leader? Angus has been crucial in the, the whole professionalisation of the party. I mean, a, along with Peter Morrow and John Swinney, Going back to the the early two thousands, then I would say Angus was was part of that group that made the party electable in the first place and took us to. He uh, played a, a crucial role in, in taking us to government in two thousand and seven. I don't think that we can uh, overestimate just how important Angus was to the party, and we saw him as a leader down in Westminster. Uh, just how he, above all other politicians, was able to hold that Westminster government to account. Philippa, you were one of the intake of the SNP MPs in 2015. Um, Angus was the, the leader of the party and he had to cope with a huge influx of, of MPs. Um, went from a, a relatively small band to uh, second biggest, <coughs> in, in fact the biggest, it's got 56 MPs at that time. So, how did he cope? Uh, Angus coped very well. I mean, I think the first clever thing that he did was that all of us were interviewed. I mean, there were some people like myself who were quite well known from 2014 and therefore what our strengths or, you know, areas of expertise were was quite clear. But actually every single one of us was interviewed to look at where did we have experience or interest uh, or knowledge and therefore we were put in our policy groups. And that was something that other parties used to comment about, the fact that... Um, you know, when we stood up to do a speech, it wasn't just something we'd been handed. We actually had backstory and, and deeper knowledge. Um, and so Angus really looked to, to use people uh, to the best way he could. Obviously, we saw him perform every week in, in PMQs and he grew into that role so quickly. He chose his questions so well that, again, you would get comments from, from other parties on, um, you know, always listening to what it was he was going to ask. 
now. We don't know yet who will be the successor. It was relatively recently that we had the election for the deputy leader um, and candidates for that role at the time included Tommy Shepherd um, and Anne Smith, who were both of whom were on this programme discussing their various plans for uh, the, the post had they, had they won it. Nobody knows yet whether either of those two people will be standing again. Um, I think that it, it, is it potentially fractious, James, having a deputy leadership contest? It shouldn't have to be. Uh, and to be fair, I don't think the last one was. I mean, everybody treated everybody else with respect, same as the one previous to that. So I, I really don't think it, uh, there's any need for it to be. But obviously it's a contest and people will be trying to sell their best qualities. That's, that's how you win. So it'll be interesting that whoever wins will not be Angus. I think the deputy leader will have a, a different role from what Angus had because of the, the long-term relationship that had been built up uh, and the crucial role that he'd had over, say, the last decade or so. So it will be interesting to see who comes out and decides that they want to put themselves forward for it and what their platform is. But I do suspect that at the end of the process, it will be a slightly different leadership, deputy leadership, than, than we had with the, uh, Nicola and, and uh, Angus. Let's talk about the time scale. What, what, when will this be decided? When will the vote take place? Well, obviously, it all only happened yesterday, yes. so I, I think we have to give them <laughs> a bit of time. But it's possible they might want to be in a position to announce the role in June when the next conference is. But that's actually quite tight. So whether they will go for that or whether they will wait for the autumn conference, obviously, that's a decision. But I, I would agree with James that I think it's a different role. Um, the party is already looking at restructuring itself, changing some aspects of the constitution. And I think that with the potential of another independence referendum in the next couple of years, I think the new deputy is likely to be focusing more on the membership and the branches rather than necessarily up the way within, within the top structure because we have to get ourselves match fit and a lot of branches recognise that. So some of the things that were raised by Tommy and picked up by Angus at the time um, are happening in the party anyway. And so Who's I would Tommy's? agree I think it'll be a totally different um, job. And I think the first thing is to be thinking what is the job? What, what is the job description? Mm -hmm. And then it becomes easier for people to think you know, is that something for me or not? And for our membership to think, is that the right person for that job? One of the most noticeable things about the last election for me was that each candidate had a very particular vision about how the job should be carried out. Um, Tommy Shepherds in particular was very much looking at the, the structure, the internal structure, revitalising, I suppose, the branches. I, I, James, do you, do you see that since that, that was aired by Tommy Shepherd? That has progressed at all? It has indeed. Actually, we had a branch meeting on Thursday night uh, to discuss exactly that the changes to the, the potential changes to the constitution and, and how branches should change and how the party should change nationally and regionally. So, that we've already taken steps in there, and Philip is right that that's going to be, I would suspect, a crucial role for whoever becomes deputy. But I also think there's two. There's, there, there's that internal bit which is vital, but there's also the external bit where what we have to do is we have to make sure that we connect with some of those voters that seem to slip away. I mean, we're still by far the most popular party, but we have, and in, in the, the, well, in the future, we've got an independence referendum to fight, so we have to make sure that we can make the connections with some of those that we lost to the, the, the fake charms of Corbyn and Leonard on the left, and also some of the problems that we had uh, further north, which led to uh, Alec and Angus uh, losing their seats, for example. So we have to make sure that whoever is in there, that the party has got some method of making sure that they can con connect with the groups that, that caused so much problems for us in the last election. I guess one of the biggest challenges the SNP faced in recent weeks, months, has been the Scottish Budget, um, which is now going to its final vote after a, a, a deal between the SNP and the Green Party. Um, James, again, is this a good deal? A good budget? Yes, a very good budget. I mean, and when you consider the financial circumstances, Derek Mackay deserves an incredible amount of praise for, for the job he's done. You know, it, it, you would never have thought that with, with our financial deal that we could have come out with such a fair budget such a, a, a and such a, a financially stable budget as, as what Derek produced. I think it, it was quite an, a, an incredible feat. And fair dues to the Greens. The Greens come in, at least they took part, mm -hmm. right? You know, they, they, they played like adults. They, they, they came with, with a, a proposal, they talked to Derek and, and they got a lot of what they were after in, in the budget. 
But all of that stuff that, that they got is stuff that we're all very comfortable with. None of the, none of the things that, that uh, Derek and Patrick or whoever it was that was dealing for the Greens uh, came to decision on was anything that would make members of our party uncomfortable. It was all, we have to try and find the money from somewhere else to do that for the Greens, but it's something that we're quite comfortable being able to do. So it, it was a good deal all round. Labour have now looked like what they are, a complete and utter shambles. They don't have any leadership, they don't have any vision, they're only there to say that we're bad. Uh, and the Tories are, well, kids might watch this programme, so the, but the Tories are uh, leave a lot to be desired in the Parliament. They are only there as a negative force, they are not there as a positive force at all. I mean, I think one of the key things is, you know, big things that uh, needed to be faced was um, trying to develop a, a progressive uh, tax structure yeah. and, and I think Derek has done an amazing job uh, with 70% of people paying less than they paid before and 55% of people paying less than they would pay if they were living somewhere else so doing that and yet raising more money is amazing um, lifting the pay cap on public sector workers and therefore anyone less than 36,500 will get a 3% pay rise um, and also extra funding into the NHS. And the fact that those three big planks of the budget Labour voted against, I'm sorry, they just don't have a leg to stand up. Philip, I guess you had the luxury of being able to watch this from Westminster and watch it unfold. Um, what did you think of the, the, particularly the, the Labour and Tory up, uh, proposals as an alternative to the SNP budget? And how did you think they performed in putting those proposals forward? Well, uh, well the only Tory proposal is really tax cuts for the rich. So, uh, you know, that was just laughable in comparison to uh, the challenges that Scotland faces with a budget that is shrinking by over 9%. So tax cuts for the rich, I'm sorry, is just not the number one priority for Scotland. Uh, with Labour, obviously, we saw no engagement until the day before when they took the SNP proposals of progressive tax, which they obviously hadn't thought up themselves, and then just thought, right, let's shove a bit on the end and uh, hit people even harder. Um, so there wasn't actually anything in that that was new or coherent, and they simply didn't come. If there was something that they had had as a good idea, um, as James said, Derek's door was open. This has had to be done, um, you know, most years uh, since uh, 2007, that there's had to be a degree of, of, of delaying and compromising. Um, but there's absolutely nothing in our budget that they should be disagreeing with, and yet they voted against it. And it's just simply hashtag SNP bad. There's nothing else. Although James, they wanted, they were suggested a, a higher tax band of 50p, and 45p if you earn over 60. Um, that's more progressive than the SNP? Well, maybe if they thought it out, but what they did was they didn't take behavioural changes into account. So when they're suggesting these massive increases in income, that was like, so everybody will pay tax exactly as they pay it just now, but only at a higher rate, where the studies show that that's not what would have happened, that some would have tried to escape it. But the, the, what, the, what amazes me for a party that consider themselves a natural party of Scotland, and they do, they, they think that they should be in control of Scotland all the time, which is behind all the problems that they have just now, is that they didn't look to see under what constriction the, the government is having to work in. So it's like they, they didn't know that the, the, the Scottish government could only spend within the budget that they were told that they were allowed to spend in. They can't just say, right, we think this tax is going to raise this amount, and so therefore we'll spend it, because we've been told by the Fiscal Commission that's just not what you're allowed to do. So it was amateurish, to say the least, eh, or it was deceitful, to say the worst. But eh, Nicola, eh, sorry, Philip had talked about, um, so they just added figures onto ours. If you remember, we did, there's manifestos where we'd say we'd produce X amount of extra nurses, and they would add a thousand on, mm -hmm. and they would say, well, we'll do that, and that was what their budget proposals were like. It was childish. I mean, there seems to be a lack of comprehension of what the devolved settlement actually is. I mean, we've had, since he was elected as leader of Labour, we've had Richard Leonard, Leonard on several occasions um, making mistakes about what's devolved, what isn't. And until we can actually control our entire tax and benefit system and make something that is linear and logical rather than 11,000 tax codes, which is what it is at the moment, then you can't close down the loopholes that allow people to, uh, to secrete tax money. And we know that on a UK basis, um, 
if all the tax was collected that is actually owed from individuals and companies, then in actual fact the debt would be a fraction of what it is. And sadly, we don't control those powers. Yeah, you can't make it a, safer, a, a fair society if you've only got control of part of income tax and, and not the other major taxes. Which brings us, I suppose, to independence. Um, and we'll talk about Brexit later. Um, but in terms of independence uh, debate and, and, and the date for the next independence referendum, which nobody knows and we're not going to speculate here because we could be doing that forever. Um, but I, I suppose what some people worry about is that in, in, governing, in governing Scotland, you can't please all the people all the time and there are hard decisions to take and the financial problems are caused, yes, by Westminster government, but the SNP have to stand by the decisions they make and I suppose what I'm saying is that it's when you can annoy people or you annoy a, su a substantial number of people, does that make it more difficult then to get them in, in favour of independence and is that a problem for the, the government? It depends on how it is dealt with. I mean, one of the things that, uh, to be fair, I think the government's been good at is, is getting the, the message out there about the reasons why you're doing this. One of the things I liked about the budget process was that very early on Derek had said, my door's open, please come, we've now got these new tax powers, let's see how we can best use them. Right, the only ones that went through the door were the Greens, I believe, maybe, I don't know, maybe the Liberals did as well. But the... Uh, and I think that's the, the attitude that has to be used all the time when we're making difficult decisions. We have to make it clear all the time, and this is not SNP whining, this is, we have to make it clear all the time that the decisions we're making are based on what we're allowed to make because of the lack of powers that we've got from Westminster. But we have to, within that, we are still responsible for the, the decisions that we do make and we have to make sure that we sell them well to people. And people are not stupid. That's why we've been, we've won five elections in a row in Scotland, Westminster and Holyrood, because people are not stupid and they know the restrictions we are working under and they know that we are doing the very best we can to, to make life better for people in Scotland. Westminster. Mm -hmm. uh, and Brexit. <laughs> so, uh, here's the thing. Yeah. How do you keep the interest up in Brexit when it is a never-ending story? Um, it is the, some of the changes are imperceptible and Europe is very good at debating things to death so that it becomes boring. It's huge. How do you make sure that people understand how huge it is? Well, I, I mean, that's something that I think has been an issue. I mean, people are already bored with Brexit. Um, you know, it's been on the news every day and, and, and to some extent people have stopped listening. Um, I think one of the problems is that people do not recognise how it will affect them. People are thinking, oh, I don't do business, I don't import export, so it's not going to affect me because it's all about tariffs and trade. Um, they may be wondering why, you know, their food costs have already gone up, why inflation has already gone up. Um, but what they're not seeing is the overall impact on things like, obviously, jobs. And we've seen that in the Scottish estimate of the impacts of the different options, which matches the pre-referendum ones and actually matches the government's own. But my concern has particularly been the cooperation we've had with Europe, the rights and opportunities that we've had. Um, things like the European Medicines Agency that has allowed new drugs to get to patients a lot quicker than before it was developed. And, and it's these kinds of things that I think are, are not being talked about. We're only talking about tariffs and trade. And for people that feels quite distant. When there isn't a GP because we're not getting EU nationals coming in. We've already had a 90% drop in EU nurses registering to come here. Social care has an even higher proportion of EU nationals who work in it. So when we you know, are really struggling to recruit someone and they can't get a dentist, there's no one to look after granny, people need to be aware that these things are all connected with Brexit. And I would say the, the biggest threat to Scotland is the obsession with Westminster with immigration numbers. There are doctors from outside the EU sitting with all their paperwork, but they need a tier two visa. And they're being told, oh, that's our allowance for the month up. You can't come in. And yet they have a job. They have everything. And the NHS right across the UK is crying out for it. That's what we will face if we do not control immigration here in Scotland. Um, Scotland, of course, does, is not in charge of its own immigration, no. and uh, the situation here is very different in that we need more immigrants, as opposed to parts of um, England which argue that they don't, whether they're right or not, is a different debate, but there's a, an argument there. Um, so in, in Scotland, 
how, how do we get that argument over to people? Because one of the things I thought in the EU referendum uh, lead, up, uh, lead up to it was the fact that people found it difficult to maybe connect emotionally with the debate. But once we had voted to leave, people started to think more of the neighbours that they had, maybe yeah, who came over from Poland, and they started thinking, well, they, may, they might have to leave. And then there was an emotional connection that hadn't existed during the debate. Do you think that's something that has progressed since then? I, I definitely do. And uh, uh, my own feeling is that it was 62-38, it would be higher in favour of Remain now, because people are seeing... Uh, I agree with Philippa completely that we haven't left yet, so the worst effects haven't hit us yet, right? yeah. anything like it. But we're already seeing... The, the, the impact on the ground, but the argument is still almost esoteric. I mean, actually, the argument is that the empire should still exist and England should still rule it. Uh, the, that is the, the crux of the, the, the Gove and the re smog argument. But in Scotland, I think we've got the message across quite clearly because people are seeing the impact on the ground that it, it's going to impact on health, as, as Philippa said. So it's impacting on education already. You know, and, and the announcement that the Scottish Government made uh, on Thursday is really welcome that the European students are going to get an extra year uh, funding because the, the, there's, if less student come, there's going to be a, a huge impact on our ability to continue with, with the, the top class education that we've got already. We have to make sure that people realise that these decisions are made well above where we have our powers and I think so far we, we've been very good at that and I think we'll continue to do so because I think it will start to hit home with people in a way that it's not done to date and then they will be uh, coming out on the streets when they see that there's no doctors, there's no nurses, there's you know, shortage of teachers and stuff like that. I mean while it's sectoral I think the issue is you touch on Richard that Scotland needs more immigrants. Ours is not just having it for particular sectors. No, 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 no. We need more working age we people. And um, one of the arguments that I used to make for independence is part of our problem is we lose too many of our young people. Um, you know, we pay our share of the civil service and yet the top jobs are all in the yeah. southeast, spending that money in the southeast. If you were independent, those jobs are here and you start to have an infrastructure that keeps some of your graduates here. But while we are hemorrhaging our young people, our working age population is dropping. And therefore, regardless of what people do, regardless of what business they're in, we need more working age people in Scotland. And that isn't going to be taken account of in Westminster. Be very clear about that. We are an irrelevance. They are obsessed with meeting this number. Yeah, I, I was on uh, another channel uh, during the week there with somebody from, uh, Jack Montgomery from Leave EU. And when we were talking about the need for Scotland to have uh, a higher immigration than the rest of the UK, he was like, Where's the evidence? Oh, there's no evidence. And, yeah. I mean, it's been recognised for years, if not decades, uh, that Scotland... Since 2001 since. Yes, certainly. Yeah, yeah that uh, Scotland needs a, a higher level of income to make sure that we've got the job done. OK, we'll come back to the issue of Brexit after we have some music. I'd like to welcome to the show Iona Fife. Hello. Hello. Uh, you're from Aberdeen? I'm from Huntley in Aberdeen. Too. OK. And uh, you're a traditional singer, would that be fair to say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to sing for us just now? Um, well, I think I'm going to sing a song that I've actually never performed live before. It's actually. risky. Um, yeah, I wrote this song um, for for my release on my debut album, which was launched at Celtic Connections last week at the concert hall, which was really exciting. But the album is called Away From My Window, and it kind of pays respect to Stanley Robertson, who was a traveller from Aberdeen and his family was like instrumental in you know having ballads and keeping the ballads going and um, this is a song that I wrote simply to add a song that I wrote to the album because a lot of them are traditional and the strike between writing and being a traditional singer is it's very um, slim there's a, a thin line so um, it's called The Banks of the Tigris and um, I literally don't write much, but I, I read an article and um, I felt pretty profoundly um, shocked at it and just kind of wrote a little bit. So hopefully I can remember it. It's bad when you can't well, remember Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. And perhaps after you have performed it, you can join us for a discussion yeah. about Celtic Connections yeah. and, and then we'll get back into Brexit. Because the two things are not unrelated. <laughs> yeah. By the river the children are playing The sun and its heat growing strong 
But around them the bullets are reaching And we don't speak of who they come from On the banks of the Tigris We don't speak of who they come from In the West Bank town of Kiara Its river now runs with red Our enemy lines always changing And we only believe what is red On the banks of the Tigris We only believe what is red Mosul, she now lies in ruins <coughs> Her people have all gone and fled Oh, our headlines are written with anger And we judge only what we have read On the banks of the Tigris We only judge what we have read The survivors, they still have their tongues tied and they won't talk of what they have seen Oh, our enemy lines always changing And we don't know of whose hands are clean On the banks of the Tigris We don't know of whose hands are clean By the river the children are playing the war silently flows by their eyes The young men are fighting their battles And we don't know of what we have seen On the banks of the Tigris We don't know of what we have seen on the banks of the Tigris We don't know of whose hands are clean Cheers. Thank you very much. Let you take a seat and join us. It's a beautiful song. Mm -hmm. um, traditional, s the, 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 the line that you're talking about between traditional music and writing new songs mm -hmm. in that vein um, is that is that sort of moving tra the tradition forward? Is that, in your eyes, what you're trying to do? Yeah, I think it's the whole idea of a, a carrying stream, which we all talk about, Hamish Anderson and all that kind of kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I think writing and um, having a voice is just as um, formidable as singing about the old ballads as they are today. But a lot of the old songs deal with the same issues that we have today. So whether that be domestic abuse violence, assault, murder, they're all documented in these um, things we call child ballads. They're not for children, they're collected by James Francis Child, who was um, a scholar who, was a, who went to Harvard in mm. America. So I think that the idea of writing is, is just the same, um, but we all should sing, I think. You're singing in Celtic Connections. Well, I was singing at Celtic Connections, which explains the the subdued state I'm in this morning. <laughs> right. um, was that a long night, was it? It's been a long three weeks. Okay. Um, yeah, so it started off with a showcase at, with the conservatoire at the concert hall, which is really nice. I'm still studying there. I'm in third year now. Um, so on top of touring and recording, I sometimes head into uni. Um, and then I took part in my own album launch, which was at the concert hall with a seven-piece band. It was very interesting um, to kind of remake all of that, and that was with an American bluegrass band, which came over um, quite freely to, to perform. And then there was the We Read Book concert, so I'm not too sure if um, you're all aware of the work of Norman Buchan, who was an yeah. MP, brother then. He actually collected songs. Um, it was very much in his his interest to collate 101 Scottish songs into like a small book and it was released in the 60s and then the Traditional Music and Song Association reprinted it a couple of years ago and each year at Celtic Connections they'll have 20 singers try to archive and record those songs and they'll make a, a collection out of it and then just yesterday it was my last Celtic Connections gig with a TMSA Young Trad Tour, so I'm pretty deep. You've been pretty busy. <laughs> yeah. When you're doing 
uh, all those concerts at Celtic Connections, do you ever get a chance to see anything else? Um, yeah, I've um, this year, Hands Up for Trad have asked me to write some reviews in Scott Storick, yeah. which is very interesting because a lot of people don't, don't really do that. There's always yeah. reviews that you see popping up in all the, you know, the big... Um, yeah, the big publications, but this is just for an online thing. So I've okay. got to see lots of bands that I wouldn't have actually normally got to see in Glasgow. So some English folk musicians, Sam Kelly and the Lost Boys, Shake the Chains, which is a protest song um, group featuring Finlay Napier, Nancy Kerr, Greg Russell, and they had Kareem Polar as well, which was very, very interesting. I would all check it out. And um, Laura Cortese and the Dance Cards, a band from Boston. So I've seen lots. Interesting thing for me about Celtic Connections is the word connections. And I suppose this year it's taking place under the shadow of Brexit. Yeah. Is, is there a resonance there? Well, I think so. Um, I've been to a few of the receptions um, which have had all the, all the bigwigs um, from who decides what in terms of culture. And um, a lot of it has been kind of standing up against Brexit. Um, this weekend we had about 200 delegates over from different countries, it's called Showcase Scotland and um, this idea of trying to keep those connections for musicians and keep the door open for touring and um, yeah I think that we're all in, you know, we're, we're standing up to that but um, as a musician I think it's quite interesting about what's going to happen with Brexit. With I've got a lot of touring in Germany, in Canada, Austria, the Netherlands um, lined up for later this year and then next year. I, I just don't know what is going to happen. Are we going to need visas to go to every country to tour there and play there? It's crazy. Are but, we, um, Philippa? Well, I mean, with the immigration bill, uh, yet another immigration bill will be coming this sometime this year. And certainly one of the sad things I came across, because I think the whole... Uh, you know, when James talked about people kind of waking up after the referendum and saying, you know, we're a modern European country, I think people feel European, um, is that a few small kind of chamber orchestras and things have actually pulled out of London because the orchestra itself is of mixed nationalities and they're concerned about, um, you know, simply how they could uh, manage the logistics. Obviously we don't know and we're hoping for some common sense in that. But the problem is all of this ability of freedom of movement to be able to not just go on holiday but to go and work and that's the the thing when you're touring you're not just going as a tourist you're actually employed um, suddenly are things that were not thought about and are things that are in danger so these are things we need to make sure are raised during this immigration bill when it comes up yeah it's quite concerning just because i never thought about it mm -hmm. before i've always just freely i went to italy a few years ago poland last year and, and now this year and i never really thought about actually i'm getting work from the european union right now and this tour is being funded by by a different country and i'm just a bit concerned and it's a shame because but that's that's the basis of brexit for mm -hmm. 40 years it has never been given credit for anything um, and our ability to move around. I mean, my husband is German, his mother was Polish, his father was German, and they weren't allowed to marry in the Second World War. They had a child that was taken away from them. His father was lifted by the Gestapo, his mother was a forced labourer. And Hans used to say, long before we got into this Burach, you know, he couldn't believe that in one generation he could marry who he loved and lived where he liked. And in another generation, we are taking that away from young people and it's it's literally that you don't know what you've got till it's gone mm. that people are suddenly oh yeah that, that oh that's because of Europe and that's because of Europe yeah I James do you think there's a the cultural world um there's a kind of deeper relationship with Europe and I, I suppose the rest of the world but, and uh, here than there is in I think maybe in cultural England is probably probably the same but maybe beyond the cultural world in England there's a, a, a more sus more suspicion about Europe. Well, I mean, we saw that during the, the referendum that there was two two distinctly different campaigns. There was one down there that that was very ugly, uh, and one up here that was where people voted no for what they considered the right reasons. But mm. it wasn't about really about closing the borders on on people. Uh, Scotland's always had that sort of, without immigrants. Scotland doesn't exist really, does it? I mean, mm. it's always had that the that relationship round about culture and Scottish folk music and traditional music has moved to countries all over the world and has influenced countries all over the world. So I think it's been reciprocal for forever, yeah. uh, as long as we've been able to move. Absolutely. We we have so many connections. The other night I was registering some tracks on PRS and I noticed uh, a French band 
titled Inch after the Aberdeenshire place had uh, recorded this Buffy ballad and I mean the level of it it was difficult for them to do that but uh, they everyone's interested in our culture and we're interested in there but I just my worry is that I doubt at the end of the day the people down south are going to be thinking what are the folk musicians going to do? <laughs> I and guess that's true. We'll see that you in Westminster. <laughs> but, um, the thing is, is the musicians union have actually they've they've started lobbying. They've started doing this, that, and everything. But I don't know what is going to happen. It's scary times for all of us, especially at the conservatoire where there's so many international and European um, nationals that are they're paying a lot of money to come here. Um, are they going to still, you know, where will well, their tuition be felt? It's it's difficult. Exactly. I was at the conservatoire just a few weeks ago with the um, the convening the education committee in the parliament. We were there, uh, and it was stunning. I mean the. We, we had acts sh showing us what they were doing. We, we spoke to a number of people, and that, that issue has been raised because we need that long-term stability. We need mm -hmm. to be able to have that freedom of movement where people can come. And my view is that whatever happens with, with Brexit, and I'm not hopeful about this government particularly, but it's, it's your generation that, that's going to be the drivers of making sure that uh, things don't change as much as they should be because it's your future that's at stake. I was, going to, I was going to say that as well about the, about the generational yeah. thing and yeah. your, your generation, like the younger generation, is Brexit something which is politicising them? I think so. I remember when I was 16, it was the first vote that I had for the referendum and yeah, I, I became very upset after that and kind of became a little bit disengaged and then the next general election I became even more disengaged. Um, but yeah, Brexit definitely got everyone talking and more so now that my group or friend group are, are looking to work. Uh, it's, a, it's the conversation that a lot of us are having, but generally um, I don't think that people my age, I'm 20 now, are talking about Brexit um, as much as they were talking about the Scots referendum. Would it be fair, Papa, mm -hmm. would it be fair to say that um, there were expectations that Brexit would galvanise people. You mentioned James, people being in the street once the full extent of it becomes known. But so far, there are there are no there's nobody on the street. So far, there's nobody really. Is it fair to say really engaged in it in, a, in an angry way yet? Uh, well, not in a not in an angry way. And and obviously, people say, oh, the polls haven't changed. But in actual fact, the kind of you know, 46, 47 percent of people who say the independent they would support independence if there was another referendum now, are not exactly the same as the 45 percent who supported it in 2014, because there's been people who've gone in both directions. Yeah. Now the third people of who a third of yes voters voted, voted leave. leave, but um, for all sorts of reasons, many uh, will actually over time now see that what they were promised if they voted leave was frankly a pack of lies and so some of them will change their mind. There will be others who have fought for independence their whole lives, so given that chance when it comes, are they really going to vote no and decide as James talks about to be part of what they call in Westminster um, Empire 2.0 really? Um, so, I, you know, I think we started at 27% the last time, we're at 47%. Um, but I think that what I have met is people who voted no, even some people who were very active in Better Together and in No, who are shocked to their core at Brexit and what has spun out of it. The xenophobia, the, the idea of putting up barriers, the disrespect that's being shown to Scotland and the threat to the Scottish Parliament now through the European Withdrawal Bill that would allow ministers in Westminster to change Scottish laws without even having to consult. So lots of people, it's all very complex stuff and it's, it's hard, you have to turn it into plain English. But there are lots of people who are going, well, I, I'm, you know, if someone asked me in a poll, I wouldn't say I was going to vote yes, but I certainly wouldn't be campaigning for no. Or, you know, I haven't moved to yes, but I've kind of moved a bit into the middle. So I think there are a lot of people who really don't recognise the UK that they voted to keep uh, back in 2014. So uh, I'm, I'm not dismayed at, uh, at the state of the polls or anything else. Is it too complex, James? Is it too co people just go, sorry, too much to think about? It, it, at, at this stage it probably is for most people, but we, we've been talking earlier on about the impact it's, it's just about to have on your everyday life. And if people can quite clearly see the connection between that impact and the decision that was made in 2016, then 
it becomes something worth fighting for or mm. worth fighting against. So I think that we're not far away from that point, but just now, for most people, and, and I don't know, I think we'll agree that, that politics might take up our life, it doesn't take up everybody else's. Mm -hmm. Only Most people are only interested in politics when it impacts on the, the opportunities they've got, the choices that they've got, the decisions that they've got to make uh, in their everyday life. So it's at that point that people will start to get gal galvanised, just like they did in the referendum. Mm -hmm. When they saw the, the, the independence referendum, they saw they had two choices of what sort of country they wanted to be. And I think exactly the same thing's going to happen in the not-too-distant future about the sort of country a part of the UK, do we want to be part of the UK, but also do we want to be part of a UK that is isolationist and doesn't really want, only wants to take and doesn't want to give, and I'm sure that most people in Scotland don't want to be part of that. What was I know about the referendum that you found and your friends found so exciting that you became interested in, in, in a, an area that you previously hadn't much bothered about? Well, I think it was so incorporated into the education system that um, I was growing up around. I was one of the first to do National 5, Modern Studies, like, and that was really in that because it was current and um, the essay questions were almost just about about that, you know, what we were doing in school. We actually had an education on it and, like, we could actually have an informed decision whether uh, this... I'm out of school now. Oh. I didn't. I think that some people that aren't educated on Brexit went to a default no. I can confirm that my mother voted no simply because of Hoover bags and the alliances <laughs> of Mom. Hoover bags. That's horrendous. That's a horrendous thing to do. Like, base a vote on... That's you're how not going home for your Sunday dinner. Because <laughs> no, you won't I'm be not. getting any. I'm not. Um, but that's mental. I, I was shocked at this, but if she's doing it, then how many other people are, are going to default no just because of ignorance? But I think that I think one of the things that, that Brexit does, and I think it's very important for us to unpack and, as I say, uh, keep things in, in very plain English and, and what are the relevances to people, is that Brexit is actually just one of a long line of things done to Scotland that we would never have done to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We would never have parked weapons of mass destruction 30 miles upwind from our biggest city. Um, you know, we wouldn't have put kind of a million tonnes of munitions in the Beaufort Trench between Scotland and Ireland and indeed dumped all sorts of spent uranium shells and rotting uh, nuclear submarines at Recife and all this kind of stuff. Um, we wouldn't have squandered over 300 billion of oil revenue without investing in either our key heavy industries in the 80s or in our infrastructure. And now we have Brexit, which we see ourselves as a modern European country. We voted to remain and we're being dragged out. And I think part of it is that democratic deficit that we have to get people to understand is not just about whether you wanted leave or remain Scotland voted to remain, and our democratic wishes are just absolutely being ignored. Not only that, I mean, there are powers that were promised to Holyrood that are not coming. What's the, what's the next big kind of argument from Holyrood? I'll come to Westminster in a minute. What's the next big argument from Holyrood? Because I guess Mike Russell is still banging that drum about Scottish Parliament. We're promised powers, we're not going to get powers, and it, it's, it could be framed as a battle of parliaments, really, couldn't it? It could be, but really it should be a, bit, a, a battle of the will of the, the, the peoples because, as, as you quite rightly say, Scotland were promised these powers. And also what's happened is that Westminster government have just single-handedly scrapped the devolution settlement. You know, this, the, the Scotland Act no longer exists and, uh, uh, the, the way that Westminster's behaving now. So, I mean, Mike's done a great job. He's, he's kept everything in front foot. And, and interestingly for Mike, Mike, I mean, this is a compliment. Uh, he has uh, he's simplified a lot of the arguments, you know, and he's made the, the impact of, of the decisions there uh, relevant to, to what's going on. Um, so I, I think where we are in the Scottish Parliament is we just keep on selling that message that these we had these powers, they're now trying they've now taken them away from us and they'll give us back whichever ones they think suit their agenda mm -hmm. and not suit the benefit of the people of Scotland. And I think that's what the, the government are likely to be campaigning on in terms of, of Brexit until we get this sorted out. I mean, that's actually the key thing, uh, regardless of what powers we might eventually get given back, is it reverses the principle of devolution. The principle of the Scotland Act in 98 was we are reserving these things, foreign affairs, defence, macroeconomics, DWP, and everything else is devolved, automatically is devolved. What they're doing is they're scooping up 111 powers 
into Downing Street and going, we'll, we'll give you what we want to give you. And it's that reversal of the principle. The fact, as I said earlier, that a minister can change Scottish legislation and that there's utterly no interest in Westminster in what's good for Scotland. If you look at what they've done to Northern Ireland because of Brexit, because of the snap election, because I've given the whip hand to the DUP, for a country that spent, where I was born and grew up, spent three decades killing each other, mm -hmm. that you would risk the Good Friday Agreement like that, then what chance do we have in, in, in Scotland? What are the next big debates in Westminster? What are the next staging posts on the journey to Brexit? Um, well, we don't have the timing. So, I mean, one of the problems in Westminster is you literally get 10 yeah. days notice uh, of what's coming up. Also, Obviously, I suppose the, nobody knows the answer to the question. Well, there's I've a degree of that, but there will be uh, an immigration bill to, to come forward, and obviously that's a, an important one for us to at least be fighting to have, um, you know, that immigration should be controlled in Scotland to allow us to set a policy that, that meets our needs. But there will be other things um, that, that have to be done that spill out. So there's about six bills that will be coming. But at the moment, the key thing is this issue of Clause 11 in the European Withdrawal Bill. Um, they voted down the Welsh Government and Scottish Government amendments before Christmas. They promised uh, last month that they would bring forward their own that would deal with the whole thing. They didn't, and now they say they'll do it in the Lords, where Scotland's governing party, i.e. the SNP, do not take seats. And indeed, all of Scotland's MPs are disenfranchised. So regardless of party, none of us have an influence on what is being done to Clause 11. And when it comes back to the Commons, it's almost at the rubber stamp time. And, and the idea that the nuances around what Scotland needs will be picked up in the Lords. I, I'm sorry, I do not hold out uh, the hope for it's that. It's a strange democratic system that has the House of Lords as being the, the safeguard for democratic decisions when the, the unelected House of Lords, which just goes to show you the shambles that the, the House of Parliament has come into. And, uh, the reputation of the House of Parliament, which in my eyes hasn't been good for a long, long time, is just shattered now. And I don't think that we should be letting the Labour Party away with us because Jeremy Corbyn and his, his colleagues should have been right behind the both the, the Scotland and, uh, and Wales amendments. And I think that's a betrayal on everybody who voted for them right across the UK, but particularly here in Scotland. But even on the basic principle, um, you know, we know that there are uh, Conservative MPs who are absolute Remainers. But you can't ask them to rebel against their party to get themselves into all sorts of difficulties by breaking the whip when in most of those votes they knew that several hundred Labour MPs were right. either going to vote for Brexit or sit on their hands and abstain. Whereas if the opposition benches had been rock solid against the destructive Brexit, then we would have had more Tory rebels, I believe. And therefore, you know, we won on one amendment, which is simply a vote at the end. But what does that vote mean? Uh, what does it change? Um, but we didn't win on any other amendment because you just couldn't count on Labour. And they've literally have a diff had a different Brexit policy every week. They're playing two sides against the middle. So people in London think they're pro-Remain. People in the North think they're pro-Brexit and they're just waffling around trying to, to kind of keep both of those plates spinning. And it's dishonest. Iona, do you find that arguments like that work with your friends or your generation? I want you to be a spokesman, please, for your generation. Um, <laughs> could you, do they work or do they require so much attention to detail? Mm. I think people are just so confused and they're so past it. Like, I, I, I struggle to even have a conversation like this with people. Usually it goes like this. Uh, what are you thinking? Oh man, I don't know. I just don't trust anything they're saying. I don't know who, what side to believe. I have no clue what's going to happen. Ugh, oh, it'll be fine. Like no one is, no one is like even even thinking about this anymore. My producer, who's actually Hungarian, um, you know, he he had to get here and then um, you know be able to live here, and he married here, and he settled here. He pays his taxes. And um, he's actually finding that he grew up, you know, during the Iron Curtain and all that kind of stuff. And he's saying that now he could go back there and he could live freer back in his home country than he could here. Um, it's very, very strange. You see, we don't understand or we don't recognise what freedom of movement means to people in Central Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, in September 16, I was on a Westminster delegation to Berlin. 
and we only had one Brexiteer in the group, but a, a very Brexiteer, and we were sitting in their foreign office talking about Brexit, and even some of the pro-Remain people were saying, oh, Europe has to change freedom of movement so that we don't need to go, because freedom of movement is the problem. And I kind of piped up and said, do you realise where this building is? We are on the other side of the Berlin Wall. We're on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Um, Merkel was in her mid-30s before she could travel west. If we don't understand what freedom of movement means to Germans and everybody east of that, then we're negotiating in a different language. Mm -hmm. So when we attack freedom of movement, we're actually attacking something that is so precious to them that they're, they're just, we, we are, we're talking and, a different language. Not long ago. No, it's oh, no, absolutely it's not. not. He was just absolutely telling me we were not. driving late at night and I, I was like, what? What? This is mental. That like, you mm -hmm. couldn't couldn't move or, or leave and then it came down and this... Well, I mean, I was changed. in Berlin um, two months after the wall came down. So most mm -hmm. of the wall was there. It just had little gaps in it and, and the difference and the split in that city and the work they've done to invest in transport connections and, and development across that. Mm -hmm. You know, so t the idea that Germany is going to sacrifice... Europe or the EU or the single market so they can sell more cars to Britain. I mean, we're, we're just uh, whistling in the wind with that kind of stuff. Um, briefly, Brexit has taken up a lot of the SNP's time. Yeah. Uh, you know, huge it's amounts. It's taken up everybody's we, time. Well, <laughs> yes, but the SNP has, an, I guess, although it's not unrelated to independence, mm -hmm. there's a lot of work to be done on independence as well, and their attention is very focused on Brexit. No criticism, it has to be. Who's doing it, who, who's doing or who should be doing the work on independence then? Well, that's why I think it comes back to the discussion about the deputy leader is, um, I mean, I'm already starting to do meetings that I get invited to uh, around the country, um, which is this getting match fit. You know, you see people in the National and some of the other papers going, oh, when, when's Nicola going to set a date? A date is not relevant. It's not a wedding. This, uh, no. And, and what I call 2018 is this is the year of conversation. This is the year where you're not actually shoving a flag under someone's nose. You may not even be putting a leaflet through a door, but you're having conversations with those relatives who voted no, with those people who have moved a little bit, but not so far. And so to me, everyone who believes in independence, whether they're SNP or from our many grassroots group, need to actually... Get yourself genned up, know what you're talking about, keep it simple, but be having those discussions. And I think 2018 is absolutely critical to that. My experience, James, is that I mean, we do the National. Um, when I'm with the National, we do these roadshows, and I've been to some of them, and I talk to people that have been to the other ones. Everywhere you go, people are absolutely desperate to do something. Uh, I, I suppose they're absolutely look to the SNP, they looked to Nicola Sturgeon and I suppose to say, please, what do we do? And I think that's probably an unfair thing to expect. But what, what would you say to people that are saying, I, just give me a date? I would say get out and start working. Yeah. I mean, this is the first year, I think this is probably the first year since I got elected as a council in 2007 that we've not had an election or a, or a referendum to fight. You know, so this is a year, uh, uh, Philippa calls it the, the, the year of conversation, but but it does, whatever it is, it's a gap where we can start to work, to build up, to be ready for the referendum. But so uh, you surely don't need somebody to hold your hand. What you need is, because the, the infrastructure's there. We've had all these yes groups before. The contacts are made. So get together. And obviously, we as elected politicians have to take a lead in some cases here. But sometimes the groups don't like elected politicians taking a lead because then it looks like an SNP mm -hmm. group. So... We, we need to use this year. We're already doing it at branch level, uh, uh, as it's happening all across the country. But some of these other yes movements should be starting to, at uh, local level, start to build up again, start to get that momentum going, because really, who knows? Who knows when it'll be? And, and it won't be a two-year campaign. Not in the slightest. You know, no. so, so there will come a point where Scotland is faced with a fork in the road. And I think it would be six months maximum. Yeah, right. And therefore, if you look back at all of our grassroots groups, Women for Indy, NHS for Yes, all the rest, most of them only came into their own in 2014, even though we'd actually kicked off early 2013. It took a long time. Well, you won't have that long yeah. time, so you actually need to already be working. And the other reason I call it the year of conversation is there will be people who, the moment there's a date, the moment there's something formal, they'll put their fingers back in their ears. Whereas at the moment, across the dinner table, at the water cooler, you know, down the pub, 
it is possible to have conversations. And that's what everyone who believes in independence should be doing. As Margot MacDonald said, if everybody converts one person. You know, so it's reaching out in your own circle. And what Brexit does is it gives you the opportunity to at least explore it, because some of the people who were no voters are shocked at Brexit. So it's not that Brexit equals independence. It's that it shows, as I said, again, the last in a long line of things no Scottish government of any colour would do to Scotland because it wouldn't make sense if your job was to focus on making Scotland better as opposed to focusing on the southeast of England and devil take the hindmost. And unfortunately, that's where Scotland is in Westminster's eyes. Last word, I know about your generation. I'm going to be ask you again to be a spokesman for that. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things I, I think during 2014, young people were very galvanised. There was National Collective, which no longer exists. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fair to say that that generation is no longer um, quite as connected to the debate now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, how would you do that? Um, well, I found that I was a little bit young and I was still living in Huntley, but even within like the trad musicians, there was such like a a surge in support and there was events and sessions and Kayleys and all that kind of stuff taking place, really going back to what what the 60s were like when I wasn't around, of course. No, no. me neither. When, <laughs> <people, laughs> yeah. when people were actually actively engaged and like they knew what they wanted and they were, they came together and even, you know, through song and all that, there was this like big movement of, of folk musicians who were really, really into their yes. Or if they weren't, at least they were having a conversation as to why, why they weren't. Um, I don't know. I really don't know what's going to happen. I'm sure that once Those events must have been very, um, a way of spreading that feeling. Yeah, Even if it wasn't necessarily spreading a feeling for yes, it mm -hmm. was a feeling for discussion and, and debate and yeah. therefore... Well, there's a lot in the Gaelic kind of tradition. They had a lot of stuff going on. and Yeah, I think that once there is a formal date, it's a psychology thing. People will start getting back together and it'll start happening again. But um, I think it's the schools that need to really... But I think the young people last time, people said, oh, giving the vote 16 and 17 year olds, they know nothing. They were stupendous. Yeah. And I think that we have to invite them in again yeah. and we need to make sure that they are part of the movement going forward. One of the problems around about that that we found, in this site particularly, was uh, that we found it hard to get into schools. A lot of the schools were, Didn't want it. They were blocking that debate. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not sure why that was. I have my suspicions, but I'm not sure why that was. But I think it's it's crucial that not just for a, any particular side, but for young people to be able to take part in something as important as that to their future. And particularly now, is you know even then they had the vote at 16 and the, and the referendum, so they should have been allowed to participate. But when you got in, the hardest questions and the most incisive questions you got were from uh, school pupils, primary you school know, pupils, what, particularly. I always oh, find listen, I had one <laughs> event. I thought, they, they'll ask have anything. You been coached. <laughs> <laughs> well, our time, our time this morning has run out. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the programme. We'll be back next Sunday at, at midday. Um, we don't know who the guests are yet, but we shall um, put the news of those guests on Twitter. Um, you can watch the programme again on Broadcasting uh, Scotland Scott, um, and it'll be up from now until who knows when. So I hope you join us next week. Thank you very much for your company. See you later. There were nine and nine nobles rode in Bancry Fair, and Pony Glen Logie was a fleur o' them there. There were six and six maidens singed in the King's Hall, Bonnie Cheney ho Bethany was a fleur o' them all. Doon come Cheney Maldrum, she come tripping down stair, and she's chosen Glen Logie among all that were there. She called on his fit boy to mark her a bed, we ribbons, eye and napkins to tie up her head. Oh, Nana, dear father, oh, that Bernardi, if she canna get Glen Logie, then for him she will dee. And her father's ain 
chaplain, a man no great skill, he's wrote a broad letter and indicted it to will. Glen Logie, Glen Logie, prove constant and kind, her love is laid on ye, must she die in her woe. When Glen Logie got the letter, will a leg glach gart he, but fan he read the letter, a tear blen his he. O oh, saddle the black horse, saddle the brun, bonny chini, O oh, Bethalny, I'll be dead ere I win. When he got to Bethalny, there was nothing there, but weeping, eye and wailing, vexation and care. O oh, pale and wan was she when Glen Logie came in, but red and rosy grew she. Then she kent it was him. Turn from Jeanie Maldrum, turn to your right side, and I'll be the bridegroom if you'll be the bride. New Jeanie's gotten married, and her talk her doon told. Bonnie Jeanie, oh, Bethany, was sixteen year old. Bethany, Bethany, ye shine where ye stand, and the header bells are ring ye shine on Fivey's land.